Hello everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video and today we are going to talk about my process for display quality painting. Uh, like that is to say, I'm going to take you through a miniature that I took to display quality, uh, which was my Keeper of Secrets you see pictured here. And I'm going to walk you through kind of the steps that I follow when I'm doing it so we can kind of unpack my process. You can see how I think about things, how I basically get to the place where you see it when it's the finished model. I have a lot of photos along the way. And most importantly, there will be references uh, to the various videos and tutorials I have that are the techniques I'm employing. Uh, a slight, a side quick note, I was originally going to do this and had recorded a whole version wherein I did sort of the little pachow thing we all know from Uncle Adam where I was going to use the little cards that pop up at the top of YouTube. Turns out you can only have five of those, and there are a lot more than five references I'm making in this video. So, boo to that. So if you're wondering, Vince, why aren't you using the little poppy-up cards that are up top so I can click through the video? The answer is because YouTube won't let me. Uh, so instead, I am simply going to reference them down below in number, and I've linked them all in the description in order. So if you want, you can go on there, you know, I'll say number three which is this, and you can go on from there. So there we go. With that preamble out of the way, let's jump into it. I started by making the base. Uh, this was a relatively simple process. This is made from uh, Green Stuff World's Roller. So I have a link to that. You can see video number one on how I paint my cobblestone bases and how I rolled them out. The chest and the grate are both from the Azerite Ruin set, which I highly recommend. As you can see, I just laid down a full layer of cork, cut it to shape, put the green stuff on top, rolled it out, and then I cut out, marked the edge of the grate, cut that out with a razor, and then sunk it down in. Uh, the hands and arms are all uh, just various. I went through my bits box and found various open hands and things like that. Uh, I wanted them, I wanted this to be the impression that there's a bunch of people reaching out as she's striding forward and they just, they just want to touch her, just want to see her one more time. So obsessed are they that she is not a thing of, of terror as much as she is just a thing of utter worship. These are people who have given over completely to the excess and power of, uh, Slanesh. So I thought that would be a pretty fun little basing scheme. And of course the treasure is an offering that's been made to her because, when you want to make offerings to greater demons of Slanesh, you you uh, you throw tons of fineries and luxury and gems and jewels and excessive uh, things like that at them. So there you go. All right, now let's get into the model. So we'll start with a little discussion on subassemblies. Obviously, I had the entire thing in subassemblies. Uh, that is to say, I, I put the whole main body together because this is kind of the minimum I think you have to realistically do. There is her larger back cloak, all her little hangy bejewly things, and her head. Uh, which, fun note, if you're going to do this sub-assembly, make sure you put the back cloak on before the head. You'll see later I didn't do that, and that ended up causing a, a fun and unique challenge because it's not meant to fit like that. Whoops. Anywho, so I started out here by doing a pretty standard zenithal, uh, and then you can see I laid down some purple, sort of in some undershading and stuff like that, where I was just focusing on, uh, on really getting the colors and the shades out where I wanted. So this is just, this is, you know, a zenithal with a purple anti-zenithal, which has a particular name, but I don't remember what it is when it's, you know, sort of the lit from below or whatever. But there was that purple, and there's also purple placed in some in some areas where I know I'm going to want it just to start getting some color down. So things like the claws and the the tops of the, um, of her leggings. And those leggings are going to be a constant thorn in my side as we go forward, as you will see. Uh, if this is where you can reference video number two, uh, where I have uh, tips on undershading and glazes, as well as video number three, which is unusual uh, zenithal. Uh, that one was really important here because 
There are areas of this where I ended up throwing light. For example, if you look under her cloak where it's kind of tucked under, I ended up using some reflected light down there that doesn't necessarily need to be light down there. That could all be in shadow, but I felt like it would be pretty boring and just kind of dark, and I wanted some more light to frame her lower legs. So, there you go. All right, so now we're back over here at the desk. After I had the colors laid down, I came in and started using some both glazes and more thin layers with my actual brush. You can see her head there in the background, which I'm working on simultaneously. And you can see I'm starting to get colors together, uh, building out the pink a little more, starting to place some uh, colors down in the recesses of like her neck. I want to draw specific attention over to her, what would be her right arms. So they're, they're left on this uh, screen. This is where we talk about sort of skin tone when you have a very big creature like this, uh, where she is quite massive in her size, uh, you don't want to have a lot of the same texture or color moving across the space. The death of visual interest in models is when you just have the same color. I see a lot of people get excited because they'll paint a big monster and they'll be like, oh, this is all the same surface. Yay, I can just paint it all the same and I don't have to worry about like highlighting it or shading it too much. Well, you don't, but then you're going to go straight down the road of that looks boring. Uh, so hence why you'll see me break up things with freehand, demon dots and textures and stuff like that. That's why you'll see display pieces incorporate these sorts of things. Because large, flat, samey areas of color are boring. You want to be providing the eye with some kind of, of reason to look at that space. Uh, and admittedly, walking the balance between boring and busy is much like Aristotle would imagine. The virtue is between two vices. Uh, so you can see, though, how I've worked in some, that's some black leather I've put in there, as well as a little bit of crimson and pink and that kind of stuff into the shading. Uh, if you want to see how the colors that I've used and how I use them, uh, then that is video number four, which is on painting Damonette's skin tone. It's effectively the exact same color palette and sort of techniques, just way bigger because obviously this girl is a lot larger than a single Damonette. Okay, very small change on this one. As I start to come forward, what I'm doing here is I want to focus in on the leggings with you. <clears throat> so I started playing with the leggings more because I wanted them to be transparent. And so my first thought was to have this sort of weak purple, which, by the way, gray purple or white purple is the hardest color to blend with uh, because it is naturally very opaque and naturally very streaky because of just the particular pigments that are used here. Um, so when you transition up into gray purple and white purple, you will very easily see a lot of streaking and stuff like that. So... Hence, you can see I just quickly threw it in with a brush, but it looks like utter crap, which is fine at this stage. I'm just trying to block colors in. What I really wanted to do was get an idea of like, well, if I do this and have these kind of colors here and then squint my eyes, and I'll often do the squint your eyes test. I wonder how many people do this, but it's a good trick. Uh, one of the good tricks to painting along with your figures to see if an effect is working, if you're going the right direction, color, contrast, etc., is paint a rough sketch of it and then squint your eyes and just look at it through your, you know, your squinted eyes, your fuzzed eyes, and see if it looks correct. Because once you remove the detail, I can't see the brush strokes, I can't see anything like that because my eyes are squinted, it'll give me a more clear picture of is my brain conjuring the right thing? Am I seeing the right thing? If that's the case, then I just need to reinforce the detail and smooth it out. If it's not, then I need to keep working. It can be a good way to test before you're finally, uh, before you go too far into the process, you know, because it took two minutes to sketch out some quick colors and know whether or not I'm, uh, whether or not I'm going the right direction. All right. So here you can see two things have happened. First off, I did a blue test on her fingernails. I wasn't sure exactly what blue I wanted to use. And I knew there was going to be a lot of different accent colors of that blue around the figure. I knew kind of what I wanted, but not how it was really going to look. So I decided to use her fingernails because it's a very small 
controlled area. Like I knew the sword was going to be blue, but I'm not going to start with the sword, right? Because it would take me a long time to paint out the sword. And if I didn't like it, then I got to repaint the whole stupid sword. And that takes a while. Whereas her nails are simple constructs. They're very simple shapes. They're a very small amount of surface area. So I can lay that out and then effectively, again, cover up most of the model with my hand as I'm doing right now as I'm talking. And I can get a concept of like, does that look right? Does that work with those purple and pinks and skin tones and stuff like that? Again, it's a lot of this is about a lot of display quality painting is about testing and refining as you go. I think that one of the things that happens with people when they look at a miniature that's been painted to a high quality, which I'm not sure I always fall into, to be completely honest, uh, is they because you only see the end result, you know? You only see the person standing on top of the mountain. You don't realize how many days they were in base camp and how much material they had and, you know, the Sherpa that was helping them up the, the side of the mountain and so on and so forth, right? Uh, and so that's one of the reasons I wanted to do this. Those little tests, being willing to take a different path, to refine, to move slowly, to take a few steps back and try something different is often the key. The idea that I have everything perfectly mapped out beforehand, it's just that's not it's not how I work. There may be a few painters out there who work like that, but then they're just constructing it probably in a different place. Like they're doing it in a, you know, some kind of digital format and then going over to the miniature or something like that. But I'm much more of a figure it out on the miniature kind of guy. Uh, you can also see I've started refining the leggings. So I kind of liked where I was going. So you can see now I've smoothed everything out. I went over and did some of that with the airbrush. Most of this work is going back and forth between the brush and the airbrush. So I will paint some area, rough it out, then I'll go to the airbrush and smooth it out. Then I'll go back and reinforce more with the brush, then smooth it again with the airbrush. And we got to go back, back, back and forth and, and so on and so forth right? Until I like where it's at. Uh, and I think that there's this huge rotation of doing that. I think a lot of people tend to, um, to sort of separate their, their airbrush into be only like a base coating tool or only for priming or something. When the reality is it can do a lot more. If you practice with it and really understand how to use the dual action nature of your airbrush, you can use it in later steps in the process. And by the way, when I'm doing this, I'm not masking anything. There's no, I'm just spinning around in my chair, grabbing the airbrush, doing the work, spinning back over here and continuing on with the brush. All right, so now we're over here. You can see that I've applied the rest of the blue. You'll also notice I've reinforced some of the shadows in her skin. Notice that some of the, the skin areas look a little darker. Uh, I wasn't quite happy with the level of contrast on her skin. So I came in and kind of both popped up some of the highlights. You'll notice they look a little more white, as well as some of the darker areas look a little darker. I did both of those things, as well as I placed the rest of the blue. Being happy with that, I said, okay, let's go ahead and get the rest of the blue on her body down. At this point, though, I was not happy with the leggings. They didn't look transparent. They just look like crap. Um, it doesn't look like skin coming through. And so I, I kind of had to sit back and go back to formula and really start thinking, like, why isn't this working? What's not looking correct? Now, part of it is because she has a very unusual skin tone. We're used to seeing effectively you know, Caucasian or, uh, or, or African-American or some kind of skin color like that, like our normal range of human skin tones through transparent cloth. But seeing this sort of white demonic skin that's like, you know, this very unusual color, it didn't quite read. The other problem was there was enough contrast with the edges, the edges of these kind of stockings that you see people's, uh, skin through is often very dark because they make it out of a non-transparent material to then show it helps separate the the skin part you know whatever your skin is um, from the actual silk legging or whatever's showing the whatever the transparent cloth is so more refinement is necessary and that's where we come over here so i realized that the problem was it wasn't dark enough 
So you can see how I took the tops of the leggings and really super duper darkened them down. And what that did was that gave me the necessary contrast to one, separate the leggings from the legs themselves a lot more cleanly. Two, to then make it so the parts that were supposed to be showing the skin, say around by the knees where there would be the most pressure and the fabric would be stretched the thinnest, had more of a reason to, it looks brighter when it's next to something darker. So as usual, the answer was more contrast. The other thing I did here is obviously I painted the sword. Um, that's just, if you want to see my, uh, my techniques for painting the uh, non-metallic swords like that, you can reference video five. If you want to uh, see my full tutorial on painting transparent leggings that is video six but i wanted to get to here before i talked about <laughs> actually referencing that video uh as well i added the freehand tattoos i knew that she had especially on that side of her where her arm is kind of back her left arm being kind of back off her body she has this big open space in the side of her torso there's not a lot of like musculature there or things going on it's more or less just uh, the stretch of her demon rib cage or whatever up into her uh, underarm. And I knew I wanted to have some fun with running a tattoo under the transparent legging. I don't know if that's really visible in this picture or not, but you can see how the tattoo continues to extend through the dark upper part of the legging. So it's you get more of the idea it's transparent. Uh, by the way, I, I mean, obviously that's just blue paint painted on top of the the legging and then some purple glazes over the top to bring it all into into snap focus by creating the actual paint layers we can trick the eye into into that thing uh tattoos are a lot of fun they're a good way to sort of break up that kind of distance to break up that kind of space uh and i do highly recommend them on these kind of big models stuff like this it's just a way to make them look so much cooler and to be completely honest it's not that hard at all Case in point, you can reference video seven, which is tattoos. Uh, so you can check that out. The other thing I did here that is of note, if you look at the blue of her corset and uh, arm bracelets, you'll notice that is now all edge highlighted. Uh, again, I wanted to do that because I wanted to create that nice sharp contrast of all of the various elements uh, that are there to separate everything out. If you want to see edge highlighting, video number eight, wherein I think I'm edge highlighting the exact same colors. I use this blue a lot. Do I use it too much? Nah. All right, so here we also have the back, which of course I was working on. I didn't take many photos of the back, but you can see I'm working on that here. The back of the miniature is obviously very interesting because she has this big tail coming out. Her back muscles are extremely pronounced. Uh, and so I knew I wanted to do something interesting with her, with her sort of cape, whatever that is. I don't know what that would be. Dress, I guess. Skirt. Sure. I want to do something interesting with it. <coughs> Excuse me. So hence, I, mil I built this big freehand brocade pattern into it. Uh, now, I think when people look at something like this, it seems, again, very complicated. This is something I teach regularly in classes. Uh, at various conventions, and I teach it in my longer form classes as well. But this is such an unbelievably simple thing to do. If there was ever a cheat, this is it. Like once you understand how to draw sharp, thin lines and how to properly glaze, this just becomes a walk in the park. So reference video number nine, number nine down below, and uh, you'll see, uh, you'll see how I achieved this pattern. In fact, it's the exact same pattern because the figure I'm working on in that was also part of a Slanesh army. How about that? All right. So next up, we attached the head. And I had to, I wanted to get the head attached because I wanted to make sure my highlighting was in line, you know, that everything was sort of lining up and, and looking how I'd want it to. It's important that the face be an area that draws attention to it. Uh, obviously, the, the head has lots of different things going on to it. What I particularly like is the way her hair came out, and I particularly like the way her eyes came out. Um, on the eyes, if you reference, I have a video on eyes. That's number 10. 
Uh, so you can go check that out and talk about sort of how to paint, uh, how to get your eyes in there and make them look interesting. And then finally, the hair. Now, I don't have anything on purple to pink hair. I have lots of different hair painting tutorials. I, I, I'll, I, I'll try to record one on this specifically at some point in time. I have another keeper. But what I will say is the trick with this is to go search up your Vidal Sassoon or Pantene uh, hair dye bottles. Just go look at pictures of that online. That's all you really need. Because those are digitally edited to have perfect light lines. Okay? And so it'll tell show you exactly where the light of the halo around the head should be. It will show you exactly kind of where and what is reflected. So just look at those pictures online. You can Google images. I Google images of like Vidal Sassoon or Pantene hair dye all the time. Just to see exactly by shape of hair and stuff. Where exactly are they? Is the... Is the crown of light falling the crown of light is just that little halo that falls around the top of your head uh and then where what parts of the ends of the hair are getting lit up where is there shadows and color changes again those are digitally touched up pictures which makes them perfect for us because they are artificially perfected so they give you lots of really good examples to work off of the other thing I've done here is I've started to black line everything as well. You'll notice that there's a lot deeper, darker lines in between many elements. Uh, black lining is something that's really important on these kind of big models, especially when you've worked a lot with an airbrush. You want to make sure the various elements of the miniature are well separated and hiding a very thin, sharp, dark line in between them is really, really helpful to that effect. See video number 11 down below, and you can see all about black lining. Uh, in that video, as a side note, I think I'm using like Vallejo Model Wash Dark Gray. You can use, you could be using anything for it, black ink. You know, you could be using like the new black contrast paint. Like there's, doesn't matter. The key is just to have a very well flowing, liquidy, inky like thing that you can draw on with a very high amount of precise control. Okay. You can see I'm also this whole time starting to work with the claws. So like I've edged out the claws and stuff like that. I'm always just constantly working around the miniature, refining individual elements as I see them. So I would say tactically, I don't take, uh, you know, I've seen this question come up. Do you take one part of the miniature to a hundred percent and then move on to like the next part? And there are painters that work this way. that will like, they'll have the thing prime black and they'll just paint like, a foot and then a shin and then a knee and then a leg and they'll do everything to 100 percent. if that works for you perfectly cool i have zero problem with that that requires you to have an incredibly solid vision in your head of what you want this thing to look like right i don't have that vision oftentimes with, with big monsters like this especially when i'm sort of being able to a bit more experimental so my general tactic is to pick a thing an element her skin her hair her claws and sort of take it to 90%. Like I take it to 10% by laying down some base color. You saw me do all that. That's 10% done. Then I'll take it to like 90% where I have most of my contrast built in, most of the detail, and it looks pretty good. And then once I'm happy with that, I'll, you know, keep working my way around, bringing everything to kind of 90%. And then I go back in and I go the last 10%, right? So I just kind of slowly refine every individual element of the mini. All right, so here we have applied the metals. Metal. Uh, and, you know, I am a big fan of true metallic metal. Uh, and I love taking and applying the lessons of non-metallic metal to true metallic metal. I'm always trying to... Um, I'm always trying to increase the contrast of the metals to show that they can be more and be more interesting. I think metal paint just has such a unique look and has a completely different feel than non-metal paint. As such, I don't like to, to just apply metal paint and then call it a day. But I also don't love to do non-metallic, especially on this. This is a gaming piece, right? Like it's display quality, but I'm going to put it on a table and go kill people with it. And... 
I and I I just I like the look of of TMM in my my army stuff, but that doesn't mean we can't fight, use the best lessons of NMM. Uh, so video number twelve will take you into the uh, how to work with true metallic metals and add you know more life and pop to them. The other thing I have started doing here is refining the gems. So you can see this girl has gems everywhere. Oh my goodness, she has so many gems. Like in her headdress and in her sword and on her wrist and in her claws. They're just, just everywhere. So uh, see video number 13, which is on painting gems. That was a very long and laborious process as I created all these little transitions and stuff on there. Uh, but I think when, when it comes to gems, unless they are micro teeny tiny baby gems, like there are a few that are on sort of Daughters of Cain model that are so small as to be basically unworkable. I don't, I don't even know why they're on there. It's kind of frustrating because they're, I mean, they are smaller than the tip of my, you know, sort of size zero brush tip. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know what this is for because I can't, gems sort of have to be of a certain size to be interesting big enough where you can show the transition between the colors. Otherwise, they're just kind of a, a nothing. So, but I, I like going through the distance to paint the gems. And that brings us to the end. There you go. I attached the rest of the pieces. Uh, I want to make one final note. You can see how I have some different colors hidden underneath her robes. Uh, so, like, there are some pinks and reflected purples in there. The purpose of that isn't because anything in the world is actually doing that. And this is where we get to the rule of cool. Sometimes, you know, we, we generally kind of want to be somewhat realistic. We want to have, you know, light act on our miniatures in a somewhat reasonable way. But at the same time, we don't need to be slaves to realism. This is art as well and so should be reflective of such and in thinking of things like that it can often be the case that when it comes to stuff like her inner robes and that darkness under there i mentioned hiding a little bit of that white paint earlier to kind of lighten it up i then decided to also place some pink in there two reasons one it helped bring some of the pink down to the lower area of the figure as it stands right now, the pink is very much segmented to her top half, the claws and the hair, right? As well as like her eyeshadow. Whereas by bringing some of that same reflected pink down around her legs, it brought more of that color down there and balanced everything out. At the same time, it also took what might otherwise be a fairly boring space and made it visually interesting, a thing to discover. And something more fun. Is there something in the world that's reflecting that color? No. Do I care? Also no. Because it looks cooler. It feels better. It makes it more visually interesting. And it's more artistic. In my humble opinion. So there you go. That's sort of my tactics for how I go about display painting. I hope that was helpful. Keep in mind this, this girl represents... 60 or 80 hours of work probably at least so it's not that i wouldn't have loved to record this all on video and then share it with you but i think you would die i don't think you can afford to watch a video for three days straight i may try to record this sometime something like this and you know play it back on 10 times speed but even then even on 10 times speed this would be a six hour video and there just comes a point where like i'm i'm <laughs> I'm, I'm working so fast you can't tell. So do I record a bunch and then cut it? Do I show you an individual element? How much devil's in the details? I don't know. It's something I'm going to continue to explore because hopefully everybody finds this interesting. We'll come back to this topic. But for now, check out those links. That should get you going on your way. I hope you find this all helpful and interesting. But as always, I very much appreciate you watching this one.